Okay, this is CVAX part two. All right, now here we, I took the, I'm going to show you what the internals look like of this thing. Here's the ribbon cable. This cable here goes down to the I.O. board, which uh, took care of all the analog inputs and digital inputs and outputs. This cable here goes to the, uh, to the alphanumeric LED display. And uh, these things were expensive at the time. I think I paid close to uh, $40 a piece for these at the time. Of course, that's uh, a long time ago. Now, they're, ca they're, four, they're four characters each and are capable of displaying complete, uh, the complete alphanumeric and some special characters. It's all ASCII driven. Okay, and uh, the CPU chip. Let's see, what is that? That is a. Okay, it's a 6502. So that's the same computer chip that uh, Steve Jobs and Steve Wozniak used in their Apple I and Apple II computers. And the reason I chose that one is that uh, the development system that I had to use to write the code on for this was my Apple II computer. And before I even built this, I had to build a. ROM emulator and an EEPROM programmer first that would go into the Apple II computer so I was already doing a lot of assembly language and construction of interface boards for the Apple II computer to, to uh, build the um, tools I needed to develop this. And just like our radio projects we have uh, you know, a number of distinct different stages. We had the CPU I guess you could think of that like the VFO. You had all the buffer chips that would uh, interface the CPU to its uh, RAM and ROM and a lot of support components here. And we had the uh, master uh, clock. There's a crystal there. I think that's generating 4 megahertz and it's divided down and, and uh, you go from there. Okay, so that's the CPU board. And if we uh, lift this out, you can see the uh, what I was calling the uh, modified wire wrap technique. I guess in the uh, in the real computer world, where you know, people did this for a living, uh, this wire, this wire wrap wire, would be inserted in a special tool with. I see so sockets with very long leads and you would actually wrap with this tool you would spin it and you would wrap the wire around these posts well I call this modified wire wrap because I used the wire wrap wire wrap wire but then I would use standard IC sockets that we would stick into the board there and then we would just solder strip the wire and solder it down instead of wrapping it and that way it would give us a nice low profile and so the wire wrap would have like maybe an inch or two of clearance necessary on the boards. And you can see all the bus structure here. It goes from chip to chip. And uh, so on. Now all the code that went into this thing is you're coding on bare metal. So you have an integrated circuit with a data book which is about like a two inch thick book it give you that would give you all the different instructions that the CPU would execute and all the timing and all the requirements on how to interface it to different components. So it was quite, uh, I still don't believe I could, I did all that back then. It's a lot of work. I guess, you know, it was anything that was there and computers were a hot commodity. If you knew anything about them, you were, you were pretty uh, excited to uh, do a different project, something that was unusual no one else had seen before. Okay, moving over to the interface board. This again would be like the Arduino's I.O. pins. These here are opto-isolators that would allow a digital measurement of vehicle parameters such as door switches and anything that would have a uh, contact. Uh, there's also, now I remember, over here I have the chips pulled out. 
there was a, uh, a DTMF decoder that, uh, and there's this small, you can see it down in there, is a uh, audio connector. And then I would connect my Yaesu H FM 2 meter HT, or yeah, I would connect a 2 meter receiver, its output would go into this, uh, this little connector. And of course, these wires would go over here to uh, the DTMF decoding circuit. And they, were, they sold a chip that you could, uh, you know, you could hear the DTMF tones, which would be the same tones used on the touch tone telephone, and you can control this. So I was able to uh, stand at some distance away from my vehicle and control and lock it, turn the alarm on and off using uh, the DTMF keypad on the 2 meter handheld. So that was pretty interesting. Uh, it also has, and I think this is the chip here, it's an ADC0809 and that was an 8 channel analog to digital converter. And over here are individual potentiometers where you would adjust with the scale because you're measuring 8 bits, I think it was an 8 bit or maybe it was a 12. You have so many distinct uh, states on a voltage from zero to whatever the maximum, which would be five volts, and you had to scale that to, to measure zero to 12 or zero to 20, whatever it is you were measuring. So that would calibrate those inputs. And of course, in the code itself, you would then write, you would have to specify what each uh, digital state meant. You, know, you would decode the uh, digital output of that. And the rest of this, I believe, is for, no, I don't remember now what all this did, is interface to those circuits. So, that was the home brewing of its day. And uh, even nowadays, I wish I would have grown up down the street from uh, Steve Wozniak. You know, I don't, I don't think I could even approach his uh, capabilities, but at least I could have hung around in the garage till they kicked me out. Say, go away, kid, you're bothering us. Maybe I could have swept the floor or something, soldered some things. Anyway, <laughs> so that's it. That's Seabax, and uh, just thought you'd enjoy seeing that. 73 and 3FJZ.